When I was 17, I distinctly remember attending a scholar symposium in which an astronaut was the keynote speaker. I recall him saying how perspective shifts 230 miles above the Earth. Looking down from the dark expanse, the lines we artificially draw between nations and people fades away. The importance of wars, politics, and divisions shrinks. And if, and if we adopt some of that perspective gained while in orbit, we together can focus and develop treatments and cures for some of the big problems facing humanity. Specifically, he talked about how difficult it is to develop drugs for cystic fibrosis, cancer, and a variety of diseases that affect us here on Earth. And how growing protein crystals in outer space under zero gravity conditions could help us rapidly design new drugs. That talk was all that was needed to convince 17-year-old me to attend this university and work with Dr. DeLucas for three and a half years. It was, an, it was an amazing experience getting to work with one of my heroes and it led to many accolades. However, I realized a disturbing truth from that time and from the last nine years conducting medical research. That is, research funding is broken and if we don't reinvent research funding, our collective health will decline in the coming decades. You see, much of the research avenue I pursued cannot be directly continued because of government funding cuts, and that is the shared story of countless researchers at academic centers across the US. When I was 11, I overheard my mom in her room talking on the phone. Um, me being the curious kid that I am, I tiptoed over, pressed my ear against the door, and listened in. The conversation was a prayer request with a church member. It turns out that my mother was diagnosed with cancer, was undergoing treatment, and hid it from my brothers and I. Um, when we later talked about it, I recall uh, bombarding her with many naive questions, given the little science knowledge I had then. However, underneath those questions lay a desire to fix or to ensure everything possible in the world was being done to make her better. In, in the end, my mom was lucky and her treatment went well. However, there are 30 million in the US with 7,000 different rare conditions of which less than 5% have effective treatments. Many of these people have family, friends, and children who just like me only want to see their loved ones get better. Just last year, the NIH rejected 82% of new grant applications. That's 47,000 ideas, or that's 47,000 opportunities that could lead to breakthroughs that could help people like my mom. This picture captures the grim state of science funding today, and I don't think we will realize the impact for decades. If you look back to the 19th century, you'll see that research was often funded by individuals, sometimes even to the point of raising ethical questions. In 1822, when Alexis St. Martin was accidentally shot close range with a musket, the hole in his side developed a stomach fistula. He allowed Dr. William Beaumont to research and literally watch the process of digestion by dangling food in a string, on a string down into his stomach and pulling it out to see to what extent it had been digested. As you can imagine, the only funding for that project came from Dr. Beaumont's own pocket. <laughs> in the 1920s, Alexander Fleming asked a hospital administrator in England for a modest amount of funding to pursue research in penicillin. The response was, we do not have money to fund your hobbies. When Louis Pasteur discovered a cure for rabies, friends and family, the poor and the rich, the policeman and the postman, all donated money to further scientific research efforts at his institute. Now, imagine you're a scientist today and you have an idea that you think can save lives. 
So you write a grant to the National Institutes of Health, but you have to wait months to hear back. Even if you're lucky enough to get funding and publish your results in a peer-reviewed journal, you have to rely on investors and pharmaceutical companies to pick up on it for you to do the follow-on work, except they often don't pick up on so you can do the follow-on work. I hate to imagine what would have happened if the treatment that helped my mom was left undeveloped in a university laboratory or in a researcher's mind simply because it was too risky, too early stage, or too expensive. This is what we knew about the human body in 1497 compared to 1543. If one looks more like a human skeleton than the other, there's a reason for that. The first is based off Dr. Galen's comparative anatomy on a creature called the barbary ape. Andreas Vesalius comes and changes all of that by doing direct dissection on actual human cadavers. Here's the key. Looking back on the history of medical research, progress, and innovation, the technologies of the time have always defined our science. In other words, our ability to advance medicine has never outstripped our ability to communicate and share what we know. You see, for monks in a scriptorium, handwriting 30 copies would have been considered a lot. But in 1543, advances in the printing press and the engraver's art allowed thousands of copies to be spread over a wide geography in a short period of time. In a sense, it was the communication tools of the time that allowed us to advance medicine and transform the paradigm. Today, crowdfunding projects have raised over $900 million on the most popular platform. The explosion of Web 2.0 and social networks enables anyone to make a game, gadget, music, or movie a reality. If you grew up watching Scrubs and are a Zach Braff fan like myself, that's a very good thing. Uh, we no longer have to wait for banks, investors, corporations, or studios to make what we want. But here's the question. If the internet can be used as a connector where like-minded communities can assemble in the cloud, pool resources and create, can the same be used for life-saving medical innovation? I believe the answer is yes, and that crowdfunding can reinvent how we work to cure disease. We are in an, in an entirely different age and an entirely different era where we have the opportunity at our fingertips to instantly connect the needs of the medical researcher with the interests of the general population who is most likely to benefit from it. A researcher can go online, post a video, describe what he or she hopes to achieve, and those who care can help fund it. How many of you have been or know someone who's been affected by a medical condition? That's virtually everybody. And wouldn't you want to give directly to cutting edge research that may otherwise not get done? So I think the question is, why hasn't this been done? About eight months ago, we set out to find an answer. After months of coding, interviewing researchers, life science investors, pharmaceutical companies, we've come up with, we've come up with solutions on how to improve biotech funding, how to address issues like peer review, meaningful levels, and waste. However, it was not until I sat in the office of a scientist who needed funding, and he shuffled through a stack of papers behind his desk, swiveled around in his chair just to plop a bundle of grant applications in front of us saying, go crowdfund it, that I realized we completely missed the mark. You see, as scientists, we're trained to focus on the details of 
methodology, procedures, execution, the how. Unfortunately, this sometimes comes at the cost of the why. Why is this important? What does it mean to someone outside of your field? Who does it affect? And why should you or anyone even care? <coughs> Evan Williams, co-founder of Twitter, once said, we often think the internet enables you to do new things, but people just want to do the same things they've always done. Crowdfunding isn't anything new. It's not about a monetary transaction or complex financial engineering. It's an innovation in something we've always done, which is communicate through stories. Since we first sat around campfires, mankind has used stories to connect ideas and emotions. Stories can get people to understand the problems researchers are tackling, involve them in the process, and motivate them to help find solutions. Studies show that our brains react in a special way when we hear a story. We, in fact, experience events as if they're actually happening to us or if we are really there. I believe sharing the unheard stories of young researchers, future Nobel winners, and the modern day Einsteins is an unprecedented opportunity for us and people to become partners in the medical research process. This isn't about funding games and gadgets. It's about funding people, ideas, and experiments that could potentially save lives and improve our collective health. Stories can give hope to patients left waiting for breakthroughs. Stories can prevent research from being used as an agenda item to which a politician can say, sorry, it's not important to this year's budget. Stories can fight anti-intellectualism and the complacency that stifles innovation and progress. Stories can reinvent medical research by rekindling the wonder and the interest in science and technology in the upcoming generation. So what can you do? I believe that if only you knew and shared the stories of the discoveries being worked upon, we could reinvent medical research and tackle some of the big problems facing humanity. Some of you may have loved ones that are impacted by a medical condition, or you may be facing health challenges of your own. But look to your left, look to your right, and look inside yourselves. You can now be a part of the solution. While donating a few dollars isn't gonna find a cure, it's a first step. And it's a step we can finally all take together. Thank you.